but attendee says I'm stabilized and our people seem to be yeah I think we should probably um begin now okay so uh good afternoon good evening or wherever you are um very welcome to the um, session on um, grammatical lieization as part of the historical um, linguistic session at the LSA annual meeting 2021. This year, as we all know, it's, um, it's different and unique from all the previous because you know, this is the first time that you know, we've gone um, remote and um, a virtual. And I hope that you know, wherever you are, you are all keeping well, staying well, happy, etc. But it's very nice to uh, you know, see all of you, even if it's uh, through a screen. And I believe that, you know, um, it's probably time to begin now. So let's begin with our first speaker. Um, our first speaker um, is, um, is um, Nina, Nina Hagen um, uh, uh, Macaldo uh, from the um, University of California, San um, Diego. Um, her co-presenter, um, um, Svera Slauson um, Johnson, you know, um, isn't here today, but, you know, um, his work will be um, acknowledged. But anyway, but Nina, she She's um, pre-recorded you know, her um, presentation, which we'll um, get to in a moment. Uh, just before we begin, um, I've got you know, some housekeeping things to uh, mention. Is that uh, I've been told that in order to um, um, record this, um, we would need to um, log out and log back in again after each um, presentation. So uh, I've been told that uh, you know after each um, 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 presenta um, presentation, everyone, um, including the panelists and every um, um, attendee, would have to log out and then I'll log back in again um, um, immediately. So um, let's observe that. But uh, I'll, I'll remind everyone again, you know, straight after you know the um, um, Q and A. But uh, bearing that in mind, without further ado, I think we, uh, we can probably um, um, proceed with uh, Nina's. Uh, presentation now. Okay, so it's a uh, grammaticalization in Somali and the development of a morphological tone. Let's begin the video. Sorry, so um, yeah, um, uh, people um can't can't hear. Would it possible to uh, you know um unmute the um audio? Thank you very much. Can we um begin um from uh, from the uh, beginning again? Hi, my name is Nina, and this is Svara. And in this talk, we are going to demonstrate how grammaticalization has affected the tone system in Somali. More specifically, we will show that a tone system with accentual properties has developed into one of morphological tone. In Somali, there are different morphological constructions which are associated with different tone patterns. Here are four forms of the verb eat. The form in A is low toned. The form in B has a high tone, which is realized on the suffix. And the form in C also has a high tone, but it's realized on the stem. And the form in D has two high tones, one on the stem and one on the final suffix. And in this talk, we aim to account for these patterns by demonstrating how they have developed. More specifically, we will argue that grammaticalization accounts for the synchronic distribution of the high tone in Somali. We will start by giving some background on grammaticalization, followed by a summary of the basic properties of the tone system in northern Somali. Then we will outline a process of coalescence that has taken place in the verbal system, followed by further processes that have, take, have taken place in the nominal system. Along the way, we will explain how these changes in turn have affected the tone system. And then we will summarize our proposal and we will end on some notes on the relationship between synchrony and diachrony. 
Chromaticalization can be defined as a diachronic change by which the parts of a constructional schema come to have stronger internal dependencies. And this type of change is captured by this famous quote, today's morphology is yesterday's syntax. And this is often illustrated with decline of wordhood shows that content items can take on a more grammatical meaning over time. And then grammatical words or function words can develop further into clitics or affixes. And the decline is probably best conceptualized as gradual or gradient, such that the labels here refer to points on a continuum of boundedness. And grammaticalization can refer to many different things. For the present purposes, we will be less concerned with meaning and more concerned with form. Uh, we will focus on one particular aspect of grammaticalization, namely coalescence, which involves a gradual increase in boundedness, meaning that function words become glued to content words, as affixes, for example. And this is also called secondary grammaticalization or univerbation. And now we will describe the tone system in Northern Somali. First, a note on the name Northern Somali. Um, this refers to the dialect group, which comes closest to a standard variety. It has formed the basis of the written language and it's the best described dialect. And all the data presented here are documented in previous literature and checked with native speakers. That is our Somali collaborators in Oslo and San Diego. Okay, first of all, the tone, con tone contrast in Northern Somali is between a high and a low tone. Or alternatively, one can analyze it as a contrast between the presence and the absence of a high tone. The tone bearing unit is the mora, and only vowels are moraic. And the location of the high tone is determined by grammatical features such as gender. And this is shown here. So uh, feminine nouns have a high tone on the final mora and masculine nouns have a high tone on the penultimate mora. The high tone is usually analyzed as having accentual properties, meaning restrictions on its distribution. First, the high tone is said to be culminative, meaning that there is maximum one high tone per word. And second, it's said to be demarcative, meaning that it's assigned to the right edge of the word. And demarcativity can play out in different ways in different languages, but in Somali, the high tone is assigned to either the final or the penultimate mora. And these generalizations hold in roots as well as in various morphological constructions, such as plural forms and derivations. Um, and here we see that these forms have a single high tone and it's realized on the suffix, so towards the right edge. And now we will turn to a process of coalescence that has taken place in the verbal system. The main construction of interest here is the progressive. And the progressive forms are grammaticalized forms of a former periphrastic construction, as illustrated here with the example, I am eating. The reconstructed form is motivated by other periphrastic constructions that still exist in the language and which have the same structure, a lexical verb with a high tone followed by a low toned auxiliary verb. And the reconstructed auxiliary verb used in the progressive correspond to the lexical verb meaning have. This is the source of the progressive suffix and it's still used as a lexical verb. Some further evidence comes from other dialects in which the periphrastic progressive still exists. Uh, this is illustrated in the examples here. But in Northern Somali, the auxiliary verb in the progressive construction has developed into a suffix as shown here. And this is interesting because it shows that grammaticalization has weakened the demarcative property of the high tone in Northern Somali because the high tone is no longer restricted to the final or penultimate mora of words. 
And this is further illustrated by the progressive forms of these four verbs. In all of them, we see that the high tone occurs on the mora preceding the progressive suffix. So now we will move on to the negative forms. In the present tense form, there's a high tone suffix. In the progressive, there are two high tones, one on the stem and one on the final suffix. And the periphrastic future also has two high tones, one on the lexical verb and one on the suffix of the auxiliary verb. So we argue that grammaticalization also has weakened the culminative property of the high tone in Somali because there may be more than one high tone. And this is accounted for by the reconstructed periphrastic construction. Okay, next up is coalescence in the nominal system. So consider first the, <clears throat> the definite forms of nouns. Definite articles are post-nominal and they show alternations of the kind illustrated here with intervocalic voicing of the initial segment. Adjectives are also post-nominal, but they do not show such alternations. So articles are therefore more bound to nouns than adjectives are, as evidenced by the presence of alternations in the former, but not the latter. Similarly, the post-nominal demonstratives also show alternations, and they, they are therefore more bound to nouns than adjectives are. But this is an innovation, because in other dialects we see patterns like this, in which the article shows intervocalic voicing, but not the demonstrative. So, in Northern Somali, the boundedness of the post-nominal demonstratives have increased. And we argue that this is another example of how grammaticalization has weakened the culminative property of the high tone in Somali, because these forms here have two high tones. The same has happened to post-nominal possessives, and they show similar alternations illustrated here. And additionally, the final vowel A of these forms has been reanalyzed as an instantiation of the definite article, creating the schema noun, possessive, definite article. And this is an innovation in Northern Somali. Other dialects do not show this. And the way we can see that this has happened is that it has created a new paradigmatic slot. The schema is now noun possessive X in which X can be another determiner, such as a demonstrative as shown here with the forms this hut of his and this house of his. And we argue that this process has weakened the culminative property even further because these forms have now three high tones. And now we will summarize our proposal, which is grammaticalization has caused the high tone to lose its original accentual properties as illustrated here. It has created forms like in the first example here, where the high tone is too far from the right edge. And it has also weakened its demarcative property as seen in the second example where we find two high tones, and this has then weakened the culminative property of the high tone. At a previous stage of the language, 
tone was tied to metrical structure or prosodic domains. There was one high tone per word, and it was assigned to the final or penultimate mora. But as function words have become bound to content words, new tone patterns have been introduced, causing a new system to develop. And this synchronic system is one of morphological tone, in which the tone patterns are associated with morphological constructions. So in these four forms of the verb eat, we see that suffixes can be low toned as in A, or high toned as in B, or low toned but inducing a high tone on a stem as in C and D. Nouns are slightly different. They can also have lexical tone. For example, there are pairs like boy and girl here, which differ only in the location of the high tone. Besides this, tone is morphological. Suffixes can be high toned and override any tone on the stem, as in A. They can be low toned, as in B. They can be high toned without overriding the high tone on the stem, as in C. And then there are forms like the ones in D, which have three high tones. And finally, we will make some notes on the relationship between synchrony and diachrony. So attempts to analyze the synchronic distribution of the high tone in terms of prosodic domains have previously been made by suggesting that there is some form of domain boundary in forms such as this house. And we argue elsewhere in an upcoming article that this approach introduces analytical problems. So more about that in that upcoming article. However, grammaticalization accounts for the synchronic distribution of the high tone in Somali. And Mithun provides the following note on grammaticalization and explanation. Quote, recognition of the processes involved in grammaticalization can provide valuable tools as we seek to explain the patterns that occur in languages, unquote. And finally, we would like to add that the Somali dialect continuum constitutes a rich area for, this, for the study of microvariation in prosodic systems and the development of prosodic types. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, thank you very much. That was um, very interesting. So yeah, so um, without further ado, we'll just move straight on to a Q&A. So uh, if anyone um, has any questions, uh, you can you um, you should sort of type a question in the chat box. So you know Nina and I and and, uh, and all the panelists can um, can see. So the first question is from um, Larry Hyman. Um, he says that, you know um, he's wondering why you call the uh, difference between uh, inan boy and inan girl lexical rather than morphological. You've shown that you know, the uh, grammatical tone system has changed, but it's still grammar to grammar. Yeah. Yeah. So Nina. Yes, thank you uh, for this question. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen in case we need to uh, reference the slides. Um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, I mean, this this is a very good question. And um, it really depends on how you view gender, I guess. Um, I, I, in a recent paper where I worked on gender assignment to nominal compounds, I'm trying to make the case that uh, gen 
this um, this has more to do with nominal form class than it has to do with a gender feature. So I think, and even if it is gender, gender is also a lexical property of the noun. So therefore, you can say that it's lexical tone. You could you could also say that it is grammatical tone. It's a little. It sort of depends on how you how how you view it. But I think you're right in that this tone system has sort of changed grammar to grammar because um, even uh, disregarding these changes that we're outlining here in Somali and in other Cushitic languages there, in general, there often are these types of uh, grammatical tone or morphological tone patterns. So one thing that we haven't discussed at all here, which really deserves its um, its own talk or its own paper is the case marking system and the allomorphy that we see there where there's also some grammatical tone. Um, so yeah, one, I guess one reason why uh, this isn't fully grammatical is that there are lots of exceptions. So it wouldn't be fully grammatical, fully productive rules um, introducing these tone patterns. So I, I hope that kind of answers the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe that, um, Professor Brian Joseph has a question. So um, if he could um, type his question, I believe that you know um, attendees um, can't um, can't speak because um, attendees are um, are muted. So. Uh, if Brian can um, type his question. We've got plenty of time, so you know, um, there's, um, there's no rush, but obviously, you know, the more questions that we have, um, the better, so we can uh, satisfy, you know, uh, more people's needs. Uh, while, um, while we're um, um, I'm waiting, you know, um, I've got a question, actually, um, if I just um, jump in briefly. Um, my question is, I mean, you know, um, I'm not familiar with the Somali at all, so you know, um, I don't know about you know the tonal patterns in um, Somali, but you know, I'm I'm, I'm wondering, um, um, assuming the Somali, you know, is a tonal language, you know, it's got a very sophisticated you know tonal um, system, you know, have your examples of um, morphologization given rise to any irregular, so not regular, but irregular tonal um, patterns? Because if the new tonal patterns are regular, then you know, that seems to be fine, and that seems to be perfectly, you know, acceptable. But you know, I'm, I'm wondering whether you've seen any um, irregular or any sort of you know, new tonal patterns that have been um, that have arisen um, due to um, grammaticalization. Well, um, it depends on what you mean by regular and irregular. I guess um, I think probably the the phenomenon that shows most variation is probably exactly what we're looking at here. So um, the, the, the tone patterns of nouns, essentially, they come into these different tonal declensions, um, which Hyman did a lot of work on back in the 80s. And then there's been more um, later as well. Um, and both sort of exceptional or irregular, irregular patterns. Verbs, on the other hand, seems to be super regular in the sense that you can usually predict one form of the from the other. Um, so I don't think that what we've outlined here has introduced irregularities. It's sort of it's all very systematic. It's just that it's not phonologically predictable, but it's predictable from what type of morphological construction it is. Right, of course, um. Dr. Hyman is um, right here, so you know it's very nice to have him here to, to have him, you know, um, review your presentation. The next question from um, um, Brian Joseph. Um, he said that you know, um, you said at one point that you there was one high tone per word. So he wonders if you would want to see the two tone forms as compounds. So, um, for example, with Spanish adverbs in uh, mente, rapidamente, with two tones, in general terms for wordhood would be useful to um, discuss. Yeah. Uh... Thank you. Yes, that's a that's a great point. Um, there's there's lots of wordhood criteria or diagnostics that we in, in theory could have gone through if we had more times uh, more time. I think um, do we want to see them as compounds? I think again that uh, depends on what what does it mean to be a compound. Um, they're generally speaking what we see with with the 
the constructions that are normally called compounds in Somali. So for example, noun, 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 verb, etc. they have one high tone um, on the final member of the compound. So uh, in that case, this would, these forms with two high tones will still be sort of a new thing, a separate thing. Thank you. So you know, a question from um, um, Ryan Lai. He was wondering if you could um, just roughly sketch the arguments against there being a domain boundary that you mentioned close to the end. Right. <laughs> um, in a sense, that's, um, I, I was thinking, maybe, I, I, I think I added a slide in the appendix. Um, we, we snuck in an appendix. So I think one argument is that it ends up being, um, if, you're, if you want to make the case that Somali has a one high tone per word rule, then first of all, it ends up, you end up having to propose a circular, uh, I mean, pr propose a circular definition of the word domain, because it really seems to be that if there is a one high tone per word um, rule, then the only way we know is by looking at where all of that, where the tones are. So, but there's also some, um, more analytical problems that we, we tried to see here, um, which has to do with, I'm just wondering how much time we have. Um, we have um, um, a four minutes, so you know, there's still plenty of time, but um, you know, um, there, um, there are um, three questions I'm coming, so you know. Okay, so maybe I can then just say, uh, please read that upcoming paper, <laughs> but, uh, or, or see if you can glean from this slide uh, what some of, some of our arguments even if it's a it might be a little opaque. I hope that's okay. Okay, so in which case, Ryan would have to wait for Nina's paper to come out, which we all you know, keenly um, anticipate. All right, we've got um, a question from you know, Virgin um, Kernel. Uh, uh, sorry for my um, um, pronunciation. Um, any idea what the um, representational difference might be between suffix terms that override the stem term versus suffix terms that coexist with tone on the stem, so on slide 21? Um, right. Uh, let's see, let's go back. Uh, well, I mean, I think we're, I passed it now. I think we're, um, for the, for the present purposes, we're, um, specifically not aiming to propose any such representational differences synchronically. Um, the, the point here is sort of that, grammaticalization accounts for the synchronic distribution of the high tone. I think that, um, so there has been, uh, yeah, <laughs> you were just curious, that's okay. Um, I think that there are, there are several ways to go. I think ultimately the, um, it needs to be some sort of morphological account. So if you uh, put it in as properties of the suffixes in question or uh, more of like the constructions as holistic units or something like that. So a constructionist approach, perhaps um, a word and paradigm approach, something along those lines, I think is what we would um, suggest. Okay, so we may have, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the last question, yet, unless, you know, we do this um, very quickly. Um, Brian Joseph has um, ha had a second question. Um, he's wondering whether, you know, have progressives are typologically um, unusual because uh, I think you know um that's the um, impression that you know we have when we look at the across linguistic compiler of so, right? so yeah. you know, have have been grammatically as a progressive marker is that a typologically um unique? yeah 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 I, I think uh I think you're absolutely right so have is a, a verb that typically is involved in grammaticalization processes mm -hmm. but um I looked it up in the the newest version of the um what is it called? The uh, the atlas of grammaticalization, world atlas of grammaticalization, and um, there was wasn't any points of this at all in there. So, uh, I, if anyone else here knows of an example, I would uh, love to hear about it. Yes, that one. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, world, lex world lexicon of grammaticalization. Heine and Kutava. And the new edition has um, has come out you know, quite um, um, recently, which uh, I'm also dying to read. So I think that should uh, you know that should um, preoccupy. That, I, I um, checked this one. Yes, there wasn't good. anything there. Yeah, we've got one minute. Can I just if, if, um, if no one has questions? Oh no, sorry. Um, um, uh, Holman there has um, has one question. So you know, um, he's asking: Is gender only for animate nouns? That no. Would be a question. 
No, that's just a, a result of uh, our selection. So it's you get the clearest pairs like this uh, often with animate nouns, but you have uh, minimal pairs for inanimates as well. And and it's um, yeah, it's across the board uh, gender, uh, sort of uh, masculine and feminine gender. I believe that at the end of the first uh, presentation, so you know um, everyone will have to. Um, um, log out and log back in again. So, you know, so see you in the bits. Thank you very much for our next talk, which I introduced in due course. Thank you very much. And th thank you to um, Nina and her, you know, um, um, co presenter for a very interesting talk today. Thank you. Thank you all.